to kick off the panel, I'd like to ask uh, you, Rintaro, from the perspective of the OECD, you, you're carrying out very interesting work in this area, particularly looking at this question of alignment. What are your sort of priorities that you see in terms of uh, po financial policy reform? Thank you, Nick. Um, it is my, my pleasure to join this panel just before the cocktail, the very last uh, session. Um, before the panel addresses an innovation in the financial regulations, I'd like to offer some perspective on the nature of broader policy challenges, broader policy challenges that need to be tackled. When we think of policies for the low carbon transition, a traditional thing, we traditionally think of a core clim climate policies, such as pricing a strong and credible price on carbon and fossil fuel subsidies, exploring, say, um, say, that kind of reform which intends to incentivize or internalize the inter external cost of carbon emission. These policy reforms remain fundamental to reducing emission at the lowest possible cost. But the impact of these core financial, core climate policies can be, can be undermined by policy misalignments, policy misalignment in other policy areas, like, I'm gonna say, investment, taxation, trade, innovation, land use. Those existing policies and regulatory system are hardwired to a fossil fuel, fossil, fossil fuel world. And governments now need to rethink those fossil fuel wiring in many areas, of course, beyond core policies. This wider policy perspective has been subject of a new report uh, prepared by the OECD, jointly with our sister institution, IEA, NEA, and ATF. The name of the title of the report is an aligning policy towards transition to a low carbon economy. This is a first diagnosis of misalignments in, in the area of policies between pre-existing policy and regulatory frameworks in sectors, sectors essential to a low carbon economy and climate goals. In 10 days, the aligning policy report, this report will be presented to the OECD ministers for their consideration. Some of the questions in, raised in the report relates to the financial system and regulations. For example, uh, is the current regulatory reforms, regulatory frameworks conducive to low carbon long-term investments? Financial stability is certainly a prerequisite to any kind of investment, including low carbon. However, some new regulations like an Basel III on the financial sector could have undermined and I say, it is an unintended consequence of their regulators, which tend to be reward short-term over longer-term investment. Second example, how do financial incentives provided by remuneration structure, fiscal measures, and performance appraisal favor short-termism? Perhaps an, uh, my next door BOE expert could explain about it. Thirdly, how can greater transparency and harmonization of corporate disclosure and crime on climate risks and liabilities that could encourage climate-friendly investment? These and other financial regulation and green investment topics, they were also addressed at another event earlier this week, this OECD's second Green Investment Financing Forum, or GIFF. Discussions at the GIFF this week between governments, institutional investors, public financial institutions, green investment banks, and uh, say um, active civil society people and green bond experts, they provided uh, some key takeaways which are particularly relevant to today's panel. First, debt markets and green bonds have the potential to channel much greater amounts of capital into low carbon energy and transport and engineering infrastructure. And there is interest in exploring how green bonds can be used to fill other investment gaps, such as for adaptation. To realize this potential, policymakers must facilitate and strength promote larger, more centralized investments through aggregation and securitization. Second, 
Other investment channels for institutional investors in clean energy show promise, including yield costs and uh, direct investment. Third, the G20 recently requested the FSB, Financial Stability Board, as Nick said, to review how the, uh, the financial sector can take account of climate-related issues. I have long been participated in the FSB discussion, but I've never heard the word green. <laughs> this brings matter of climate and climate policy risk into the sphere of international financial regulations and offers an opportunity to start addressing important policy misalignment. Today, I have mostly spoken about the role of policy, policy makers in addressing misalignment. Of course, with many bankers in the audience and in the panel, we also need to focus on what the financial community, community can do. I'd like to challenge you to deepen your thinking on how financial sector can use its innovative capability to, towards this. First, align markets with a low carbon transition. Second, reduce short termism. Third, increasing discru increase disclosure of climate risks to investors. And lastly, uh, create incentives for a much greater shift towards low carbon investment from billion to trillion. Leadership from the financial sector is needed to inform and drive policies that will help mainstream low carbon investment. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. If I could just, just follow up, you, you gave a challenge, which is good, and I'd like to challenge our audience to make sure that your voices are heard through the Twitter feed. Are you seeing uh, the finance sector getting positively engaged in policy? I think there's been a lot of concern in the past about negative effects of lobbying, but are you seeing a positive interaction on this agenda now? The question is yes and no. First of all, I'd like to say, before thinking of this, we have to mobilize our tensions of financial regulators and the Ministry of Finance and central banks to this issue. Otherwise, green investment, green infrastructure investment, or say even more, say climate change issues at large, this, say in the whole of our policy discussion, we have to mainstream this issue beyond the discussion, policy discussion within the environmental ministry. We have to mobilize the attention of finance ministry, economic ministry, and transportation ministry, and the agriculture ministry as well. With such an assay, um, whole of government approach, we can ask financial community to follow us. Then I say the role of financial community now is to push your regulators, your relevant ministries to draw, shift your, their attentions to green issues. This is um, quite important, say, in many countries. Great, thank you, and thanks for that uh, set up for, for Michael Sharon from the Bank of England. Uh, the question of sort of mainstreaming is very interesting from why from a prudential perspective the Bank of England has now been focusing on climate change. Michael, please. Yes, thank you very much, Nick. Um, it's actually wonderful to be here with an audience where I don't have to explain why a central banker and a prudential regulator is talking about green finance and climate change. So um, thank you for being here and thank you for listening. Um, the Bank of England has been very, very active, as you may know, through the statements of Governor Carney in investigating what effects climate change may have on financial stability, this, the, the safety and soundness of our banks and banking systems, as well as our policyholders and our insurance companies. That's the spectrum, that's the paradigm in which we are looking at climate change under. From that paradigm, we were asked by the UK um, government, by DEC, to look into a piece of the um, financial system and understand how well they've adapted or not to climate change. And that piece of the, um, that piece of the, the, the system was the insurance um, industry. So what we did is primary research. We went out, not only did we send out questionnaires, which you can get good and bad answers from, even though it did come from your prudential regulator. Um, they did come back, but then we followed up and we did very granular one, two hour interviews with them to really understand what they thought about it what they were doing about it, and how they addressed it. And this is both general insurance as well as life. 
And climate change affects these two types of insurance differently, but equally importantly. For the asset management side, as you might suspect, the life is very important. And for the physical manifestations, the GI is very important. And it probably isn't a big surprise to you that some of the companies were extraordinarily switched on. Some of them had scientists working since the 1970s and have been following this and were very sophisticated in their thoughts. And they gave us things to think about in terms of potential prudential risk. And others were less engaged. And right now we're in the process of finishing up this report. It will be submitted to the government in July and hopefully it will be out and published publicly before September or cup one. So we're hoping, fingers, fingers crossed, boom, you know. But that is our first big piece of work that we did. But from there, you may have heard the governor mention things like um, stranded assets, i.e. the mispricing of assets, and there's been a lot of discussion on this. Secondly, you may have heard him talk about the tragedy of horizons. Again, short-termism. Are we investing in the short term? Are we not using our fiduciary responsibilities, both in insurance and other asset management correctly? And the other third one is disclosure. And there's been a lot of talk around that. Because ultimately, if you're not disclosing everything from your accounting principles, from the amount of carbon you're using, how can anyone make a good decision? Now, we're with the central bank and the prudential regulator. So what we've decided to do, and this was part of a greater initiative within the bank, is we set up called the One Bank Research Program. And what we're going to do is take some of the most fundamental questions and some of the ones we've been talking about here today and some of the ones around these three statements, we're going to begin doing in-depth research on. Um, over the course of the last year, with a tremendous amount of help, and we're indebted uh, to UNEP and to Nick and Simon and the crew there, have helped us, introduced us, and to be honest, many of you, many of you stakeholders have been extraordinarily helpful to us in our inquiry. We're going to continue to dive deeper with people like you, academics, to try and rigorously understand what threats there are to both financial stability, i.e. what happens if you have mispriced, what are the secondary effects to that, when do environments collapse, i.e. financial environments, and what are the potential risks embedded in that. And we're looking at it not just from the physical point of view, i.e. the manifestations of climate change, and we've had some very interesting science that we've picked up on that lately, but also from the transitional risk, the risk that's often brought up in terms of um, behavioral economics. And there's a whole suite of potential risks to the system there. Everything from disruption from technology, from policy changes, um, stranded assets would certainly be one of them. Investor preferences would be extraordinarily important for this conference. And so the bank is, over the course of this summer, will take three, four, maybe five of these and do ex very, very deep economic as well as policy research on them to get a better understanding of what risks are posed both to the system and to the underlying institutions within banking. And that's something I think that we're really proud to be doing. And um, in addition to that, I guess the third quick suite, and we've been very lucky, and Nick alluded to this, is many of you have reached out. Um, uh, we, we've, been, we've spoken to the PBOC in China. They're doing extraordinary work there. Um, Brazil and so many other countries. So we think, if nothing else, the opportunity for all of us to meet and talk to each other from around the world. I think um, we're particularly lucky here with what great representation we have having India and China, two of the most important countries in the world in this topic, here talking to us. So that's what the Bank of England's doing these days and what we're hopefully will continue to um, do research on. Brilliant, brilliant, and, and th thanks very much. And, and uh, the, the Simon, you mentioned Simon Zadek, the other co-director of the, of the inquiry, so he's here as well in the room. Um, if I could just follow up, the, the, the tragedy of Horizon is a wonderful poetic phrase. We don't often hear poetry from central bankers. What, what do you see as a tool to try and address that, overcome this we, uh, horizon? Is this emerging practice of environmental stress testing? Is that one of the ways we can do that? A variety of ways to potentially look at that. Environmental stress testing is certainly one of them. Understanding the business models of asset managers, of banks, of, of insurance companies, where their exposures lie. Because if nothing else, one of the most important things that large institutions can do is signal, and if you understand, if you've got good information, you've done stress testing, and you've done stress testing, thank you, um, you understand where your exposures are. If you don't know where your exposures are, how can you act? Um, so we think that's very important. Additionally, the governor's made reference to distortions in the market, and certainly many of the asset managers are held to, um, to benchmarking and how, how many standard deviations you are away from other competitors. Is that necessarily the right way to look at things, or maybe it's a distortion? 
we don't know yet, but it's certainly one of those things to look at, to explore. But certainly in um, some type of stress testing, further disclosure, and understanding what's a distortion and what isn't. Lovely, and I'm, I'm sure uh, Fred Samara at the end will, will have some thoughts about uh, asset management business models, so uh, we'll, go, we'll go on to that. Please uh, do start uh, putting in your questions for individuals or for the panel as a whole, because uh, we're eager to um, have some interaction. Uh, Ratin, we've been uh, working with you, very, very good to be working with you in India. It's a very exciting time, uh, lots of opportunities in India for, for investment. How, how do you see this question of the sort of financial rules of the game and where policy reform is needed? Thank you, Nick, and it's nice to be here with, as you said, a very diverse audience. Uh, let me sort of start by sort of uh, saying that I was somewhat puzzled by two things, one will come a bit later, that emerged across many presentations in the morning, which talked about the whole climate finance issue as a, essentially addressing risk. Uh, where I'm sitting, uh, climate finance is an opportunity. Uh, the word risk doesn't really come into it. And I'll tell you why, uh, and I'll begin there. The, the big problem that India and many other developing countries have is accessing sustainable finance, sustainable in the sense of credible, predictable, long-term finance for infrastructure. We don't have a problem attracting foreign direct investment for Walmart, not at all, or IKEA. But we have a big problem getting people to invest in ports, railways, uh, you know, the power sector, et cetera. And part of the reason for that is regulatory risk. So for us, sustainable finance is an opportunity to sort of engage with the global financial system to increase their appetite for investing in places we want them to invest, which is traditional infrastructure, and therefore for us it is an opportunity. So the world view coming from India is somewhat different from the sort of risk view. Uh, in this, we have many obstacles in, in the way the global financial system is structured. The first obstacle was taken away today. I was, I was thrilled, absolutely thrilled, by what uh, Monsieur Henri de Castries said about uh, you know, bad regulation for good reasons impacting uh, the global financial system in a way that detracts from investment coming for sustainable development, uh, which includes, of course, climate finance. Today, my banks in India have money to lend, but because of Basel II, they cannot lend to infrastructure, forget sustainable infrastructure, because the sector limits are maxed out. But what we need to lend for is infrastructure. And if Basel III comes on board, God help us all in India, not you. Now this is a classic example, I think, of what, what AXA was saying, that here you have something that was done because, because things went bad in the Western financial system. And now more things are done to fix what went bad. Then you have the taper as a sort of medicine in the evening. That's another issue. Uh, and this imposes huge constraints on the ability of developing countries to do something about finding finance for infrastructure and the action on climate finance, whether for, especially for adaptation, but also for mitigation, in countries like India is going to be in the asset class of future infrastructure assets that we are going to build over the next 15 or 20 years. You're going to see increases in railway investment 500%. You're going to see increases in energy. My colleague from Yes Bank was talking about this. 300%. So, so we are talking not replacing existing assets with greener ones, but the bulk of assets that are going to be created in India are going to be new assets. And to make these green, we know makes sense. The dilemma we have in approaching this whole question of climate finance at a global policy level, I'll share with you and uh, you, you may wish to think about it. What you're asking us in India to do is, is very daunting. You are asking us to be the first major country in the world to complete its industrial transformation without substantial recourse to fossil fuel. You are asking us to be the first major country in the world to complete its industrial transformation without recourse to fossil fuel. And you know what, we'd like to do that, not just for global commons reasons, but because it's good for productivity, it's good for our energy security, but the how is important. There are many hows that the international community needs to discuss, but in the context of climate finance especially, the how that we need other than technology and, and, and means uh, is a better, a, a financial system that is able to better target $7 trillion of saving annually 
into the assets that we require for our industrial transformation. And if that can be done using technology and resources and incentives to make it so without recourse to fossil fuels, that's a good thing. But status quo thinking here is the enemy of the possible. I'll give you another example. Many banks today announced that they were going to exit the coal business. Now, in my country, as somebody said, we're going to double our investment in coal. The challenge for us here is that our coal mining, our coal use is incredibly, incredibly inefficient. And because it is inefficient, it's incredibly carbon expensive. So a major focus of industrial policy in India in the, in the coal sector is how do we mine coal more productively? And the answer inevitably leads us to more sustainable, lower carbon ways of mining coal. Now, if you're going to come and say that we're not going to look at coal because it's dirty, that's not going to help uh, countries like India reduce their carbon footprint because to the extent that technologies and alternatives to fossil fuels are not available, 9% growth and giving 300 million people access to basic electricity is going to involve dealing with fossil fuels. So we will need to get fossil climate finance into areas where we can use it more cleanly and that we fully recognize is necessary and important. So much for the globe, I'll just spend a couple of minutes talking about uh, what's happening in the financial sector in India with respect to uh, carbon finance. So remember what I said, I mean, the, the big policy challenge in India for us is infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. Infrastructure financing in India comes from banks with a little help from Japan uh, and possibly China in the near future. Uh, we have the Basel problem, but we also have an issue in enabling banks to incorporate the returns from efficient productivity increases in uh, increasing investments in sustainability uh, in, 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 their, in their credit agreements. What we are doing there is uh, two things. We are trying to make sure that we have efficiency benchmarks that we put in place. And our research shows that if we, if we demand efficiency from infrastructure producers, that normally le leads us down the sustainability path. Efficient investments are sustainable and greener, quite typically. We have now evolved market instruments, which I can tell you about in the discussion if you like. Uh, frameworks such as the National Voluntary Guidelines. Uh, we have, because we are energy short, companies have to disclose how much energy they're using. And that automatically gives us a carbon calculus. And interest rate subventions can happen on the basis of a demonstrated track record of reducing dependence on energy. Not because we want to become green, but because we're desperately short of energy. So green helps us, you know, sort of economize on our most scarce resource. Uh, we are trying to bring more and more international finance that comes in for climate finance through budgetary pipelines. We're trying to get away from global, you know, this Jeff type individual projects stuck in the Ministry of the Environment, giving sort of grace and favor grants to individual industrialists to bring the money on budget and then channel this money either to leverage in green finance or to uh, promote uh, areas like, like sustainable energy uh, actively through budgetary instruments, which puts them on budget and therefore transparent. An important thing we are doing with the help of Japan and Germany is we have a large, small and medium uh, you know, SME sector, small and medium enterprise sector, and we need to create, what, five million jobs a year, it's frightening. And these jobs are going to be created in the SME sector because you don't create jobs in organized manufacturing. You create them in SMEs. Uh, with SMEs, what we have tried to do is provide subsidized lines of credit to SME sectors just to improve their energy efficiency and increasing employment by being energy efficient. So we have this sort of trilateral deal with Japan and Germany, which is helping us do that. We uh, have a, the most exciting thing that's happening, of course, is the, is the fact that unlike many of your countries, We've had a fairly cowboy financial sector with disastrous results for us in terms of financial regulation. Uh, doing business in India, I know, is difficult, and, and the big aim now is to fix it. Now, part of that is to try and develop, and we've been doing this now for four years, an Indian financial code. Now, this is exciting for us because when we develop that Indian financial code from scratch, we can start already to incorporate sustainability concerns in the Indian financial code. I'll just give you two examples of what we are doing there with the Indian financial code and stop. Uh, with concluding comment. Uh, one example, the draft Indian Financial Code, which I hope will go to Parliament in, in December, has a provision that says that any uh, measure for market infrastructure or 
lending that involves an interest rate subvention or subsidy must quantify the costs of that activity to society. And the costs, of course, include environmental costs. So automatically at that financial level itself, the, the code will try and incentivize movement of capital towards sustainable uh, finance. The second example I can give you is that the, uh, if, if there is any subsidy given for the provision of any service that is funded through public banking assets, then the financial code requires that, that subsidy be specified and calculated. This will enable us to go a long way in making sure that we do not subsidize fossil fuels. Frankly, we don't know whether we do or not because we tax our fossil fuel companies very heavily, but we provide consumer subsidies. We don't know what comes out of the wash. So this will help us find out what is happening. So in conclusion, I mean, you know, we're talking here about a country which is trying to transform the lives of three, 400 billion pe million people. Uh, we've gone some way in doing that with growth. The biggest impediment to that now is the cost of doing business and the fact that our productivity today is five times lower than China's, although the labor costs are twice as high. So we simply aren't able to capitalize on the opportunities we have because of low productivity. We see a win-win game in cleaning up our act. That will increase productivity, but the international and domestic barriers to do that uh, in terms of getting finance there need to be removed, and that would require, I think, uh, much more of the attitude that the AXA chairman displayed today, which was thrilling, than the status quo so far. Thank you. Ratan, thanks for a characteristically uh, provocative uh, statement. We've got a few interesting tweets coming in here um, about uh, that, uh, that you d you're not really seeing this agenda from a risk perspective. Um, and I just wonder where you see issues of sort of, I don't know, natural disasters and maybe issues in the agricultural sector and investment there, water and so on. How, how are you looking at that perhaps from a, a risk perspective? Honestly, we, we've just had an earthquake on our borders. Uh, we've had, we have cyclones somewhere in the country every two years, and that's happened for the last 30 years. So the idea that, so I, I have a risk management framework in place, but the idea to sell the idea that there is incremental risk arising at a national level or even in our neighborhood is going to be much, much more difficult. I think the, the best, uh, the risk is there, and it needs to be dealt with. I, you know, we, 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 we host the Himalayas. Between, between China and us. We're fully aware of that. But these risks have been there for a long time because, because poor people have led risky lives. So it's not a matter of securing people who are hitherto secure against risk. It's a matter of securing hitherto insecure people against further risk. And that does require us to give them more secure livelihoods while protecting them against risk. And therefore, the, the language of risk is not a helpful language in the context of my country in dealing with climate finance. Wonderful, very, very clear. Uh, Rick, you have a wonderful uh, world view looking, looking out from the World Economic Forum, a center of many of the partnerships that have been driving uh, progress on climate and other sustainable development issues. Where, where do you see the priorities from a sort of financial policy perspective? Uh, thanks, uh, Nick. And um, this is a session about uh, the financial system. And I, I salute you and, and the UNEP for asking the big questions in your inquiry. And everybody looks forward to, uh, uh, to the results of the work. So wh what I'm going to do in my uh, time here is to focus on that, those systemic questions of change and anchor it really in the context of Paris and COP21. So in other words, the climate aspect of sustainable uh, financial system. Now, we all know uh, that the holy grail over many decades for rendering uh, capital allocation decisions or the financial system behavior more sustainable is to ensure in, in some way or ways that environmental externalities are internalized in those decisions. And that, again, as has echoed through the halls here over the last few days and over the last couple of decades in discussions and settings like these, that the most straightforward a way, an effective way to do that is, in the case of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, is for societies to find a way to, to put a price on carbon, whether explicitly or implicitly, namely through taxes or cap and trade or through 
a direct regulation that sets performance or efficiency requirements that creates an implicit, implicit price uh, on carbon. This, uh, uh, this, takes, this, this would take much of the guesswork out of uh, capital allocation decision making in respect of environmental externalities because it's basically shifting directly the relative prices, right? But uh, as we know that this is the big market failure uh, for public policy to address, uh, or you might think of it as a big collective action problem, there's another way to looking at it, but we also know that it's a very, very difficult problem to crack, absent a sense of political crisis. And uh, frankly, it doesn't look like we're gonna get that degree of sense of crisis or urgency between now and, and December, or even in the next perhaps a year or two, uh, to get to that point. So then the question I wanna pose for discussion today is absent the availability uh, in, a, in a broad way of that kind of a direct frontal approach, is there anything else systemic that can be done uh, meaningfully uh, to internalize a lot of the externalities environmentally into financial system behavior? And I think the answer to that is a resounding yes. It starts with the recognition that capital allocation decisions are centrally about guesswork. It's about making informed judgments based on careful analysis of the best available information, number one, and number two, making sure that those judgments are anchored in the right frame of reference, namely that you're optimizing against the, the right set of performance criteria over the right time horizon. And I do think that there are uh, some market failures there, maybe they're smaller than the big one that we, I just described, but they, they are significant, or put differently, there's some significant collective action impediments that can be worked on, and that, I would argue, can, can be the subject of major progress by the time the world comes back to this town uh, in uh, late November, early December uh, of this year for COP21. Now, let me talk about the two principal ones that I see and what the pathway is be, uh, to see some progress. Now, the first is a lack of comparable information. That is essential. It's the lifeblood of investment management decision making. You need comparable, comprehensive, reasonably good information to be able to benchmark uh, against uh, across a wide range of different investment opportunities. In the case of environmental externalities, there hasn't been a framework that allows for a common metric, allows for that comparability and benchmarking, both on the risk side and the opportunity side, by the way, going directly into the investment uh, community. There's been a lot of reporting and disclosure, but it has tended to be apples and oranges and pears and kumquats, you know, all sorts of different uh, uh, formats, different cuts at the information and the rest. And much of it doesn't go directly in the reports that are consumed by the shareholders in the investment community, the mainstream annual reports. This, uh, I don't think, takes a major political crisis uh, to fix. Optimally, the, the uh, public policy community would do this. The, the, uh, the securities registration authorities, the regulators will otherwise do it. They have not been doing it, but it is not required. And I'll explain uh, in a minute. But th the point here is what the investment community would need in the mainstream annual report are, is that comparable footprint information, and there is a widely accepted uh, format for doing so created by WBCSD and WRI many, many years ago, and then a reasonably consistent format by which uh, corporates, emitters, lay out their assessment for shareholders of the physical risks, the regulatory risks, the technological risks, the changes potentially in the relative prices of of energy that they're gonna face, the social risks, and what their strategy is to address that. Remarkably, despite years of these discussions, that common framework uh, does not exist uh, yet in the mainstream reporting. The second uh, uh, smaller market failure or collective action problem that I think can be worked is with respect to financial, uh, I'm sorry, fiduciary culture. There, this is a, a complex mixture of behavioral factors that results in an unduly short-term 
frame of reference for the evaluation of asset management performance. And that has the result of underweight, underweighting ESG factors, environmental, social, and governance factors, uh, whose impact tends to mature or manifest themselves, not over the short term, but over the medium term, including with respect to climate. Uh, our colleague from the Bank of England just referred to this earlier, I think through Governor Carney's phrase of the uh, uh, tragedy of horizons, I believe he called it. And again, this is a behavioral problem. This is not a, a problem that requires cabinets uh, to risk, you know, to, to put in a central plank of their election campaign and, and to rise or fall on that, or it doesn't require a huge shift in weather patterns to, to raise an uproar and create massive, dis uh, these are technical issues. And, and in fact, the culture of financial, regulatory, and accounting uh, and investment behavior norms over the years has not come principally from the public sector taking the lead. It's come out of an evolution of best practice turning into customary practice in the markets, among the market participants themselves. So I would, uh, I would submit that these two collective action problems impede capital allocation efficiency of even the existing signals in the market, however messy they are, and how un however uncertain they are. Now, they don't require a big po shift in political economy. And although financial regulators have been basically absent, the good news is that in both of these respects, there are some very tangible, significant initiatives that have already got a lot of momentum behind them that are just awaiting for moving from best practice to customary practice, from an initial set of uh, uh, first adopters uh, that could be moved from between now and the end of the year, or certainly over the next year or two, into uh, snowballing coalitions that begin to shift behavior systemically in the markets in both respects. And what I'd like to do is just briefly explain both of those. The first on the information side is something called the Climate Disclosure Standards Board Framework, the CDSB Framework. This grew out of a recognition by the main climate disclosure, corporate disclosure organizations a few years ago that they needed to combine around a single ask that can be put in the mainstream reports and investment community for all the reasons I'm talking about. And they formed a consortium. I'm talking about CDP, uh, WRI, Series, uh, WBSD, a whole range of these organizations supported by all five of the major accounting firms on the technical side and the major accounting associations they elaborated quietly and, and through technical work that common framework, and it's been released and is now being picked up by the first uh, 50 or so major multinationals, and there are about $45 trillion worth of institutional investor networks that have said if the companies report in this fashion in their mainstream reports, we'll begin to factor this, this in. Now, the stress testing, including the one in 100, could fit nicely in that standard framework for what you put in your annual report among other types of sensitivity analyses as they get elaborated, whether they be fossil fuel sector specific like carbon tractor work on, works on or others. But what we need is a common international framework. There is no IASB, if you will, for this type of, of, of information. But nicely, the business and environmental communities have innovated to put it together. It now is awaiting to be picked up and scaled. The framework will be expanded as of June 8th to include forestry and water and other non-carbon aspects of environmental externalities. So this is an asset that can be picked up and could be a deliverable in COP21. The second thing on the fiduciary behavior. Here, in my view, the top of the investment food chain, investment value chain, if you will, are the big institutional investors, the owners of the assets. If they decide, as they've been prodded to here in France uh, by the announcement uh, this morning or the earlier this afternoon, if they decide that they need to take a very specific look at the carbon performance and risk and opportunity within their portfolios, and that they insist that this work be done in the asset mandates that they let out to the asset management companies, if a, a sufficient number of those very large uh, public, often public, but not necessarily public, institutional investors decide that that's the way they interpret fiduciary responsibility, that de facto they're taking more than a quarter by quarter, they're taking a medium term view, and they want ESG, in particular these climate related considerations, to be very specifically analyzed and, and be part of the asset management uh, uh, pr 
pitch uh, that is made, then I can tell you, I, I have a reasonably high degree of confidence that the asset management industry, which is highly competitive, will orient itself very quickly to figuring out the right kind, the best kinds of ways to do that. They will compete like mad against it, and this will begin to ripple as a best practice into maybe more of a customary practice through the behavior of other fiduciaries and the way you let out contracts, uh, asset mandates. The bottom line is if that's done, and, and indeed if they took the step to say that we're only going to let out, or the majority of the mandates are going to be medium-term mandates, not one-year mandates, that would have a, a huge systemic potential effect. So both of these, and, and I think this is best epitomized by something called the, the Portfolio Decarbonization Coalition, which is a group, as I understand it, of 11 initial major institutional investors who've decided to think about taking a very specific step in this direction. That's something to build on between now and December. So we've got both of these things cooking. They're really very practical building blocks. They don't require big policy judgments. They don't require uh, the FSB or each of the regula regulators uh, from a regulatory compliance to take steps. Although, frankly, the FSB's process to now look at climate change would be useful and I would just add that simply something that would be enabling here would be for those regulatory authorities, be they on the security side or on the banking side, to simply articulate and informally to their financial communities that these two best practices are very constructive. They're what one would expect of good financial governance within a company on the one hand or on a, on a fund on the other. That confluence of factors, public-private innovation, echoed by some soft guidance from the public authorities, I believe in both of these respects, could do a lot toward making the financial system much more sustainable, a systemic change in behavior. And I think we should take advantage, just to close here, of the enormous opportunity created by the French government in saying that this COP will be different from all previous COPs, uh, in, the sense, in the following sense, that it is not only going to be viewing the outcomes of a COP solely as the UN negotiations among foreign and environment ministries, but they have also said that what they call the solutions agenda, that is to say the business-led and public-private initiatives about scaling practical behavior, whether in developing countries or developed countries, is going to be considered part of the outcome of the COP, and they have indicated that that's going to be part of the main part of the program. These two pieces would be a very salutary part of that, and I think the world ought to including many of us who work in the private sector and the civil society communities, ought to take full advantage of it. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Rick. <clears throat> Just two points there. There's some great work being done uh, by the PRI, uh, UNFFI, Global Compact, and also the Inquiry, looking at this fiduciary issue and, this, and, and the results of that, actually how much this is a barrier, what could we do to actually align uh, the, the, the attitudes of asset owners with these issues. So that will be coming out in September, so fits fits the time frame. I think what I'd like also to ask the audience is I'm hearing a number of things from our, uh, our speakers about which could go into the list of ingredients for what the, G, the, the G20 uh, requested FSB, how that should be framed. So if we're thinking about the FSB, as Rintaro said, they haven't heard the word green before. They're scratching their heads. They've got to look at a complex, uncertain things like climate change. How can we help them actually focus their job? We've heard about transparency. We've heard about fiduciary, fiduciary and prudential uh, issues. But I'd like to hear your questions. What would be your key recommendations on the issues that actually this FSB uh, initiative should be looking at so that it delivers timely, precise results by Paris. So I'm looking at the Twitter screen. I want your suggestions um, coming up soon. Uh, Dr. Wang Wang, it's great to have you here. It's been lovely to work with you uh, in China uh, at the inquiry, uh, work being led by my colleague Simon. We've been very impressed by this very systemic approach to thinking about uh, green finance. We'd love to hear your perspectives on how you, s how you see this. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Uh, thank you for the engagement. I'm a now a uh, unique Chinese uh, speaker, so maybe uh, today so I'm a uh, unique uh, Chinese uh, participant. So China is the uh, most uh, population country in the world, but now I feel very lonely and alone. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I'm thinking um, now that why not invite more and more Chinese uh, to enter the conference instead of shopping outside? <laughs> and and why? Because the climate change, you know, it's, it's a, a 
and climate uh, finance is so important. And month, one month ago, we uh, we invite uh, we uh, China established uh, uh, official organizations. We call it uh, uh, Green Finance uh, Committee, and I was uh, uh, selected as uh, uh, Secretary General. And uh, and uh, uh, Li san uh, Secretary General is often doing something like <laughs> always doing very busy doing, but. Uh, but the problem is that even as a, a secretary general or a professor in a university, I'm still find that uh, the green finance or the climate finance is a very, very new term in China. So the, the first point I have to say is climate change, we have to, uh, no, no, climate finance, we have to often talking to the Chinese. So, uh, so if we have the Chinese uh, support, the, the, the climate finance will be uh, much more successful in the future. That's the first, the second, uh, the first point. The second I have to launch that is I have to introduce the, the, the China's uh, low carbon uh, market systems. And, and in 2008, uh, China established the first uh, environmental exchange. And in 2010, uh, uh, China uh, has uh, achieved the first uh, uh, tran transactions of uh, energy saving and uh, emission reductions. But now the problem is I have to say that uh, nowadays in China, the low carbon uh, uh, market system is still not very uh, measured. And uh, the uncertainty of risk reduce the passion of the investors. So I have to say that is uh, we need uh, help China. Uh, we need to uh, push the China and the Europe cooperation. And uh, in my opinion, that is in the uh, climate finance that uh, European country like the professor and uh, China like the students, but maybe the postgraduate. And uh, that's the second point I have to say. A third point that is I have to say the uh, China's uh, development uh, value. And uh, uh, believe it or not, and uh, those, uh, Chinese people uh, who are shopping in Paris, they like the, uh, they uh, buy those uh, package, buy those uh, perfume, like buy a vegetable. Huh? But I'm, I have to say they not represent all the Chinese. They just represent 1%, maybe a 0.1% Chinese. They are so rich, but in China, they are still have a lot of poor person and uh, China nowadays still is uh, very developing uh, countries. And so for China, it's also uh, manufacturing uh, great powers. So ha they have to uh, balance between the development and the low carbons. But for uh, manufacturing great powers, it's very, very difficult. And, but China has tried best to do it. And China is a, it's a one of the earliest to join the uh, Tokyo uh, uh, Protocol country. And uh, uh, China realized that uh, uh, deal with uh, climate change is international obligation. And the last year in, in 2014, China's carbon inten intensity filled by uh, 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 30, 38%. Uh, last year compared to the compared to the 2005 and uh, China's goal in 2020 is to cut the carbon emission per unit of uh, GDP by uh, 40 to 50 percent than uh, 2005 so it's very very hot so I have to say as the secretary general of uh, China green finance committees I have to say nowadays China is in the uh, green revolutions. So I know today we have a lot of uh, uh, international journalists, uh, journalists uh, here. So uh, my conclusion is uh, you have to uh, encourage China greening process instead of uh, criticizing China. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wang Wen. So I think that's a, that's a message for uh, the French visa department. Expect a lot of Chinese visitors from the uh, business and finance community later in Paris. So yeah, 
good, very good point, uh, well made. And I think this, this point about uh, encouragement is absolutely important. Obviously, China is, is, is a country which has a long tradition of, of five-year plans. Um, can you tell us anything more about what's been thought of in terms of green finance for the next plan? Uh, the, the, the China uh, policy very much. You know, every five years, China have a strategic plan. And uh, next year, we will have uh, 13, 13 uh, plan, uh, five years plan. And nowadays, uh, it's sure to that the green finance, the term will be uh, written into the will be written into the documents of the 13 uh, five years uh, uh, plan. So uh, it's true that uh, green finance, even it's very new in China society, but it uh, become uh, one of the uh, final decisions. So we are trying the best. Wonderful. So that's one of the things we can look forward to after after Paris. Uh, the new, the next Chinese five-year plan, green finance uh, at its heart. So, uh, Fred Samama, you're you're on a policy panel. Uh, you're from the private sector, from Amundi, a great uh, French asset manager. We've heard about uh, business models, uh, and how are you thinking strategically about this? And, and where do you see policy support um, helping? I think uh, Rick gave us a very interesting uh, suggestion about the dynamic between market innovation and public innovation, how those can come together. So where do you see policy support helping your process in, in the asset management business? Yes, uh, thank you, Nick. Um, I will start with uh, an observation and how um, governments can, uh, can, uh, can play a role. Uh, the observation is that uh, more and more um, long-term investors are now tackling climate change-related risks. And uh, for three reasons, because they think that there is a market failure regarding climate change risks. The second is that they benefit from innovation, and the third that they benefit from the examples of their peers. So in terms of market failure, uh, right now markets are saying that uh, the probability of uh, polluting companies or companies having stranded assets to be penalized, uh, this probability is pretty low. And long-term investors are saying, well, if I think that this probability is 15, 20, or 50 percent, then uh, I have a risk that is not correctly uh, rewarded. And then it becomes my fiduciary responsibility to identify these risks and to reduce their weights in my portfolios. So now more and more long-term investors are saying climate change means risks that are not correctly rewarded, and again, risk management, I need to reduce um, these um, exposures. The second point is financial innovation. Uh, these risks are not so simple to address. You've, you've heard that uh, uh, many times. The good news is that um, many new players or existing players are developing innovative solutions to address these risks over the long run without impacting the uh, market exposure over the short run. And you have other solutions like engagement or disinvestment that are working as well or different initiatives related to the, uh, to the green bonds. My point here is to say that uh, there's uh, a new series of innovations to help long-term investors to address these risks. And third, um, the other good news is that um, the asset owners that are exploring um, this new field are benefiting from the uh, examples of their peers. And, um, and um, President Holland and uh, Finance Minister Sapin, and you were kind enough as well to mention the Portfolio Decarbonization Coalition that was created under the umbrella of the United Nations to gather all the doers around the world that are already decarbonizing their portfolios and accepting to share their best practices with their peers and with all the other uh, long-term investors. So the point was to say uh, people are scratching their head around the world to find these solutions, and if we can gather them and, uh, and if they accept to share this knowledge, it will accelerate the um, transfer of technology to the, to the other, uh, to the community of the uh, long-term investors. And so, um, as it was mentioned, we are glad to report that we already have $45 billion of commitment. And it sends a very strong signal. It says that to all the other um, asset owners, 
it says it's doable uh, now and it's scalable. So if you're a long-term investor on the world, you have a message in terms of risk management. That's your fiduciary responsibility. You have a message about innovation to help you. And you have a message that your peers are already taking action. So it's more and more complicated for a long-term investor to say, well, I'm not to do anything. More and more we see, and the Montreal Pledge goes into that direction, that people are opening the door and putting that topic on the table. So not to answer your question is how governments can help that. Uh, well, there is a pretty simple um, decision that uh, governments can uh, implement at no cost. Uh, the fact to request the, um, the um, carbon um, um, transparency of the, uh, of, of, the, of the funds. It's very simple because if we say that there is a risk and it's complicated to see the opposite, and based on the fact that uh, fund managers or asset owners are disclosing all kinds of risks, risk related to equity drops, increase of volatility, and so on, it's pretty normal that all the asset owners uh, should disclose how they are exposed to climate change related risks. And it's particularly true for public funds because ultimately uh, the, the owners or the beneficiaries of the uh, public funds are governments and citizens. And so it makes a lot of sense to know if the um, public money is investing into polluting companies or not that ultimately will impact uh, the lives of the citizens. And actually, um, we have a good news this week because France is uh, passing a law on that. So France is uh, asking all the, um, the um, asset owners to disclose their climate change related risks. And so it doesn't cost anything. And then it will accelerate this process that we observe already around the world. So other countries could very easily replicate this uh, financial law uh, or this uh, uh, policy-making uh, uh, innovation from France. Wonderful. Very, very good. Thank you. And uh, do you think the, the new requirements, uh, firstly, are going to be uh, possible to implement? Are the tools there to enable the, f the funds to respond to this new requirement? And secondly, what do you think that will do in terms of innovation in the investment industry, actually having to start uh, disclosing more? Because often we find that disclosure can actually drive innovation. Um, I think that um, markets are good at um, allocating uh, resources when there is um, a demand. I mean, so I. I the fact that the French government is saying, yeah, now you have to disclose the, uh, the carbon footprint means that all the asset owners will scratch their heads and say, fine, I need to find the tools and so on. So they will provide the resources to the entire ecosystem that will help them. And by doing so, uh, it will uh, facilitate uh, the establishment of, of, of standards, uh, acceptance of, of the uh, different uh, methodologies and so on. So my point is to say uh, that's very good that we have an objective and now all the um, academics, the uh, providers, everybody will come with some ideas and naturally it will deliver you know, some better understanding of these risks. And I'd just like to, to mention one figure that I, I did not. Uh, the fact that um, the asset owners that are already uh, interested into climate change uh, are representing uh, $95 trillion. We know that because that uh, the people that are behind carbon disclosure projects. So that means that, and so these people are asking for the carbon footprint of corporates around the world. But these $95 trillion up to now were doing nothing. They were just very, very quiet. And my point here is to say that each time we, we, we create a transfer or a shift from I'm interested into action, each time we have a shift for 0.1 person, meaning nothing, that means a shift of $100 billion. And so here is my point, actually, to say that policymakers have now the access, in a certain sense, to a fantastic new force uh, that will create the pressure on polluting companies. Because again, 0.1 shift means $100 billion. 
And by having this carbon footprint, it will accelerate that shift. And then again, that can help governments to implement uh, taxes on polluting companies because they will be helped by investors. Wonderful. Thanks very much. We've got a good uh, set of questions coming in, which I'm going to sort of throw at the, uh, the, the, the panel. One of the things we, we often see is that actually the civil society organizations are uh, an important uh, force in terms of setting new expectations for finance. And it'd be very interesting. We haven't heard much from civil society here today, but very interesting to hear from different, uh, d different pa panelists where you see civil society in this role in terms of uh, pushing the uh, agenda forward. I don't know who wanted to, who'd like to take that one uh, on. Yeah. Rick? Uh, uh, Wang yes, Wen, you, please. You, you, you mentioned a very, very good point about of the, of the, of, of, of a gap point. Because uh, for me, uh, I'm from China, and, uh, and uh, I, today I always uh, uh, sit, sit uh, there and, uh, and uh, listen and, 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 and uh, study. That's, uh, I, uh, all the speakers remind me a very, very important thing that is a uh, different development level. Nowadays, more, a lot of European country uh, uh, speakers, they are talking about the risks of the climate finance. But the problem is in China, most of maybe 99% Chinese people don't know what is climate finance. So that's a different you know, level. So you're talking about a civil uh, society organization. That's a very, very important. Public opinion, you have to influence them. Even China nowadays uh, become more and more you know, democracies. The, gov the government will think, okay, what's the what's what's concern of the public opinion? So by uh, thinking that is, uh, on one hand, that's a different uh, developer level. Uh, on the other hand, that is, uh, for the, for the professor, uh, European countries have to concern the different uh, 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 developer levels of China. You know, I give you an example that is, uh, nowadays when I uh, travel in Berlin or when I travel in France or British, you know, more, more and more people, uh, they hate driving. They hate driving and, and the changing to take the bicycle. But you know, in China, more and more Chinese, you know, buy the car with a higher carbon why, okay, emission. Why? Because they have never had the car experience. They have uh, shared the, the happiness life like you did in 1980 or 1970. So, so that is, we have to teach them. <laughs> we have to teach them, the, the, uh, as you mentioned, the, 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 the public opinion or uh, the civil society. Yeah, okay. Great, Thank, thanks, Wang Wen. Uh, Rick, on civil society, where, where do you see their role here? It, two, two things. Uh, first is that they've already had an absolutely catalytic role. Uh, and both of the things that I mentioned, and, and Dr. Roy was just telling me on the side here, quite rightly, and I forgot part of the punchline, and that is that these two elements basically need each other. They, they're, they're basically symbiotic. Because if the, there's an appetite for the, uh, the owners, the asset owners, to understand better what the carbon profile and the risk profile is of their assets, they need some sort of a common metric that's reported to them in the mainstream filings. Well, the, it's the civil society organizations that took the lead in basically creating this consortium, reached out to the business community, and they put this thing together. The accounting community came in. So, but the, 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 really the, the motivation there was, was originally provided, I would argue, by uh, key civil society, environmental uh, NGOs and whatnot. Now, uh, and indeed, even the, the consciousness raising over the last five years in the institutional investor community, it's the environmental NGOs that have played an absolutely critical role in this regard. And I won't name all of them, but I think many people in the room know them. So that's one level. Now going forward, let's face it, uh, it this is such a welcome initiative because indeed the, the, a, the asset owners, these institutional investors sit at the very top of that investment value chain. But who are they? They're actually just intermediaries representing civil society, basically savers, Sa people saving re for retirement or for college or whatever the case may be. That's civil society. They own those funds, basically. So the, the, the role for them going forward, logically, is to take note uh, of some of these uh, pr more progressive steps that are being taken, because not every government in the world has taken the, the forward-leaning step of the French government to provide this kind of guidance. And civil society can help to spread that consciousness and create a wider demand 
for the funds themselves just to exercise better uh, governance uh, in the manner that's going to be required here in France. And nobody is better positioned to do that than a whole range of different civil society uh, groups in this regard. So I, I view their role as absolutely critical. There are other strategies, of course, that civil society organizations can pursue in respect of climate investment, and I respect all of that, but this is an emerging new one that I think uh, has potentially a cascading effect in the system. Great, thank you. I mean, there's a question here from Adam Wasserzug, which I think is, is very interesting. I was very struck uh, on the snowy streets of Davos this year, meeting a, a leading Indian uh, renewables entrepreneur uh, and saying, uh, we don't want your aid, we want your pension funds. Um, and uh, what's interesting, maybe for, for you, Rintaro, and also for you, Ratin, I mean, how do we actually get those uh, so-called partnerships working between sources of fund, the big pools of funds we've been talking about in, in the industrialized countries where real money flows to the infrastructure you, you're talking about, this urgent infrastructure? Maybe you, Ratin, first, but Rintaro from the OECD would be very interested in your perspective as well. Yes, thank you. Uh, <coughs> I think that's, that's the key question. I mean, you know, uh, for us, actually, Sustainable development is mainstreamed into our overall development process. Uh, so what we need from the international community, and, and you know, there are uh, what, what a lot, number of things you've said are very helpful, actually. Because if I can deal with perceptions of regulatory risk for overall infrastructure finance, if I can get long-term investments, and a recognition that in countries like India, and probably China, from what you're saying, your payback from environmental, from your payback in terms of sustainable finance will not come from saying, you know, you're not going to go down the path I did, but saying that the, you're down the path that you are in India in the case of coal because you are inefficient. And, and that is why the government of India, for instance, has said that I want an energy audit done. That sounds environmental, it's not. Of every single business proposal, because businesses in India use energy extremely inefficiently. My payback comes from using energy more efficiently. And a financial system that recognizes this, rather than putting prudential sort of doing another Basel III for the environment, I think will be far more helpful than, uh, there are other things, there's another question there, which was what can the OECD do, this may interest you, tanaka uh, to, to help India bypass the coal phase. Well, you could talk to Saudi Arabia, but you won't. Uh, and you could, but you won't. So I, we take that as, as part of the game. Uh, so, you know, so we will be in the coal phase as long as you don't talk to Saudi Arabia. You get me, you know, clean Saudi Arabian oil and I'll stop working with coal. Uh, the other thing that OECD countries could do is, is, is not apply the metrics that apply to you in this phase of development. I think this was what Wang was saying, like, coal is bad, oh my God, let's run away from it, to see whether we can actually reduce our carbon footprint from using coal more judiciously, more resourcefully, and with far more transparency about the costs. We are in a phase which, you know, France and England were in the 1980s. In my city, in Delhi, 80% of children under 15 have the lungs of 30-year-olds, have the lungs of 30-year smokers, 30-year smokers. So it's not that sustainable development is not important, it's not that civil society is not concerned. The question is, what do I do about it, and, and how? So, so the, the, there needs to be an understanding that, that the path that we will follow will not be a path that, you know, it's, we are going to do what the OECD did minus the coal phase. That's not going to happen, and, and going down that path will, will result in unhelpful friction. What we need to ask is, how do these countries use resources efficiently enough to minimize the carbon footprint while undertaking the transformation? And if that means, you know, if you can tell me how to do it without any fossil fuels, I'll do it. If you can tell me how to do it with as little as possible, that would be a much more productive conversation. Um, first... Of course, OECD members, advanced economies provide, uh, say, money, support through green, green fund. Second, it is quite important to introduce emission pricing, which makes coal power generation, not only in India, but elsewhere, very expensive. Third, perhaps uh, to show the future of renewable energy, particularly its cost, its future cost. We are seeing, we are discussing quite often, the locking effect of the investment, particularly infrastructure. Once you invest in coal power generation now, it continues to, to produce electricity for 40 years, 50 years, 
in uh, 2050, coal power, coal power generation will be quite expensive. So let them know in the long term which is the best choice. And to let them know how quickly the cost of renewable energy, particularly solar panel, solar power generation, is getting cheaper. Now, in, at the utility level, in, uh, in some cases, the cost, marginal cost is almost equivalent to a traditional conventional power generation. And lastly, mobilize institutional investors, like uh, pension funds, insurance companies, sovereign wealth fund, those kind of institutional investors in OECD countries, mobilize their money into the investment in developing countries. For to, to, to attract that kind of investment, of course, we have to set a um, appropriate regulatory framework in OECD countries, but also assist developing countries to prepare favorable investment climate. This, is, this could attract the uh, institution investors now suffering from very low return for the short-term investment, could make a very, uh, say, economically rational investment in developing countries, including India. And I'd like to just follow up on May. I mean, you, you talked at the beginning in a very powerful phrase about how many policies were sort of hardwired for the fossil fuel economy, which we're wanting to leave. And uh, we've heard Ratin talk about uh, uh, the impact of Basel II, let alone Basel III. We had Henri de Castri talking about solvency. What sort of, as, as, a, as a long time financial policy maker, where, where do you see the need to actually reform these existing rules of the game so that they can better support the allocation of, of capital? Um, the reason is quite clear. Um, first of all, FSB or financial regulators, finance ministry, central bankers have been focusing upon since 2008 for, for seven years, eight years, upon how, to, how not to repeat the financial crisis. So the uh, mindset change is quite important. So this kind of forum is uh, very, quite helpful to put the pressure upon those, and I say, powerful people sitting in the center of financial regulation system. Um, secondly, perhaps the, uh, the pressure from private industry, private financial community, seeking quite uh, promising investment return minding also the, uh, the, uh, the concern expressed by the Bank of, Bank of England people, um, to reflect that kind of concern, uh, the private industry should talk to their policy makers, regulators. This is uh, quite essential. Very kind, thank you. I, I see we have uh, President of the COP, uh, French fi uh, Foreign Minister Laurent Fabius joined us, which is, which is great. So I would like to really to ask the panel for your closing thoughts from, from different countries, from India, from China, from Bank of England, from OECD, really about the, the, the message that really we should be taking in terms of financial reform and, 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 and climate through to the COP. So maybe, uh, Fred, if I can ask you to, to start the ball. Um, I would say to, um, to combine all forces uh, the uh, incredible news is that uh, uh, for many years um, governments and NGOs have tried to, to, cl to tackle climate change. We have observed over the past days that uh, corporates were entering the game and now institutional investors. And by having this combination, and um, it, uh, it will send signals coming from different directions to policy companies. And any uh, decision taken from the uh, um, the policy making side reinforces, reinforcing these uh, different forces will be good. So my point here is to say instead of having one pressure, by having multiple pressures on policy companies, it will facilitate uh, the objective of having uh, a low carbon economy. Thank you. From, uh, from your perspective in, in China, Wang Wen, what would you perceive that one key uh, priority? Uh, I think uh, next year uh, uh, will be a uh, face a very good opportunity because uh, next year China will host uh, the G20 summit and uh, uh, 
our in institute, the Chongyang Institute for Financial Study, is a leading uh, think tank for G20 study in China. We are leading the T20 China. I think next year, so we need uh, your help, we need uh, OECD help, we need a lot of countries' help, and uh, to push and promote the green finance or the climate finance into the G20 leaders' communicate. Right. Maybe there will be a, it's a, it's a, it's a very excellent uh, mission. Uh, it's a very exciting mission if, if we can do that. So we try our best. Yes, thank Fantastic. you. Fantastic. So a very good way of taking forward the momentum of Paris. Rick, from your perspective, please. Just two, two quick thoughts. One, just to reiterate, I think we've got to take full advantage of this tremendous opportunity presented by COP21 and the solutions agenda track that the French government has carved out. And we've talked about two very concrete things that interact in a dynamic way that could get done and could actually make 2015 the year that this transformation begins to scale across the capital markets. We should not miss that opportunity. We should encourage companies and funds to get on board these two trains uh, that interact. Second thing is on the developing country aspect, which I didn't address in my comments. Basically, uh, there needs to be some long-term fixes, which has to do with improving the risk environment in countries by and large. But there's a bridging strategy here that we need to get more serious about. And that is to use, to use the assets we have available uh, in the way of public money to blend it much more effectively with the private capital that's out there to mitigate the risk, to change the risk return profile. We do not optimize the use of capital in international financial institutions, particularly development banks at both the national and multilateral level for that purpose. We are working on a, an initiative with the OECD Development Assistance Committee, which will probably be announced at the uh, Financing for Development Conference in Addis, which is basically to create a platform of both the, uh, the governments that have risk mitigation Rick, and I think we need investment to speed up, sorry. ability to plug in, as well as the whole investment value chain to link up their investment processes much better for this purpose. Thank you. So, quick, right in from you. I, I must take advantage of the fact that Mr. Fabius is here <laughs> to say that uh, many things are quite depressing about the development conversation today. Post 2050 SDGs, we're not happy, FFD is in a mess. But the one thing that's going really well is the discussions of the COP. And I think they're going well because the COP has, has very encouragingly looked at the climate finance issue in the context of the constraints that, that developing countries face in accessing global finance. If that works, and in a sentence that means that the COP must address what the chairman of AXA said today, if that works, and if those two conversations are joined, then I think we'll have a successful COP. And in that context, if this climate finance problem is resolved in the way that we are trying to do it, then you will not find countries like India wanting in terms of taking a common global citizen view of the climate finance challenge, uh, the climate challenge. Wonderful. Michael, from the Bank of England. All right, two quick points. First one is we have to continue our research and our object into where climate change could potentially threaten our objectives because ultimately, if we're not horizon scanning, if we don't understand those, we've heard people talk all day about an unorderly unwinding of the system. That is the central bank are the things that we're looking out for. But more importantly, the second thing, and I think exactly what you're saying, it's the green finance to the extent that we have within our remit the obligation to work with other central banks and other players in the community to help fi find solutions to this. I think those are the two things that it's important for us to continue on. Wonderful. And um, Ritana, a final word to you. Okay. Um, I stress the, uh, the need to align policies and the whole world government approaches. I like to stress the importance of political leadership. And as a role of central government led by politicians like the uh, President's Office, Prime Minister's Office, uh, my institution, the OECD, continues to make an utmost effort to support UN process Addis Ababa, New York SDG, and of course COP21, as well as um, G20 process, uh, Turkish presidency this year, and Chinese presidency next year. Wonderful. I'm very, very optimistic that we're, we're heading in the right direction in terms of the financial system. We're building a sustainable financial system as we speak. Thank you very much. Thanks to the panel.